Perfect. Yeah. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. James Sally from uh, British Columbia. Um, so he, uh, I don't know how, how many people knows about him. So just for, for, for a small introduction. So he did his PhD from UC Santa Barbara with Joe Polsinski and David Morrison. Then he was a postdoc at Slack, Stanford. And right now he's doing his uh, second postdoc, second postdoc program. Yeah. Third actually. Right. Yeah. So at, uh, uh, so uh, uh, James, you can start. And he is going to talk about an outstanding uh, paper that he had written. And we are trying to understand his work from his uh, talk. That it is about eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and disorder averaging in the context of gravity. So you can start. No, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to talk and for the very kind introduction. So I'd like to tell you today about some work I did earlier this year with uh, some of my colleagues at UBC. So with Jason Pollock, uh, Moshe Rosali, uh, and David Wakeham. Uh, and we wrote this paper sort of in, in the wake of some of these very exciting developments that have happened in the last year in trying to understand uh, the meaning of the gravitational path integral and in particular how it's sort of some of the implications for the black hole information paradox. I think it's fair to say that, you know, in, in the last, say, 40, 50 years of the black hole information paradox, I think it's always been assumed that to understand how information comes out of a black hole, one would really have to go beyond naive semi-classical effective field theory or the you know, semi-classical effective gravitational field theory uh, and really look into the microscopic and non-perturbative aspects of uh, evolution of a black hole. And so it was very surprising and very exciting in the last year. So I apologize. The batteries have just died in my earphones. I should have replaced them earlier, but I'm just going to do that right now so that I can actually hear questions. One moment. Sorry. There we go. My apologies. Ah. The side effect is also these are noise canceling earphones, so I don't have to hear the background noise of uh, children running around, but you may hear them. So if it ever gets loud in the background and you can't hear me, let me know and I can well make some no, effort okay. to change to okay. change that. But I no no promises that I can actually keep no, don't worry. noise in there. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So you know it's very exciting in this last year, the realization that uh, one could see maybe not, you know, the complete unitary evolution of uh, a black hole, but sort of aspects, sort of key signatures of the unitarity of black hole evolution within the semi-classical field theory itself. Uh, but one of the things that I found sort of most perplexing or distressing about this whole development is it seems to be in order to sort of see unitarity, to restore the unitary evolution, one has to sort of, well, at least step back at least from the idea that one's working with, say, a single pure unitary theory of quantum gravity and replace, say, your uh, single uh, unitary quantum theory with some sort of average over theories and so some ensemble of theories. And so what I hope to do today is to convince you that uh, the sort of type of ensembling, the type of averaging that's needed is actually doesn't really require you to give up the idea of having a, a single unitary quantum theory, that it's a type of uh, ensembling that's relevant to questions that you would ask about a, a single quantum theory. Uh, and so to begin, I'd just like to sort of start uh, to remind ourselves about the sort of the puzzle uh, in, in thinking about the gravitational path integral. And so let me just sort of say some things that are, I think, hopefully rather simple to begin with. So let's just ask about computing the partition function in, say, in a field theory, say one conformal field theory. So here I'm going to talk about the partition function on a, a Euclidean circle, a thermal circle of length beta. So I'm going to always represent that just like this throughout my talk as some circle. I'll put a beta there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm working, say, in uh, a one a zero plus one dimensional theory that always say, you know, here is some sort of suppressed so d-dimensional circle. So the CFT partition function 
uh, on the thermal circle like beta is just the trace of e to the minus beta h. And this is just some number, some real number. Uh, if instead of thinking about one well, CFD. Uh, Jamie, uh, so thermal circle means you want to mean that the time is integrated from zero to beta. The time is integrated from zero to beta. So yeah. this is my, my thermal circle. Yeah. Say there's some parameter tau, some Euclidean time around this circle, uh, and it uh, has length beta. And so that just appears as the temperature in my uh, exponential. So I could do the same thing and define uh, an n-fold partition function where I have n CFTs, each with its own, say, temperature beta i. And the partition function for n CFTs is just the product of the partition functions for each one independently. And this again is just some, well, it's a product of numbers of real numbers. But it's just a product. Uh, this n CFTs, the each copies are identical or they, they, um, are... they could be the same CFT, they could be different CFT. Let's assume for now that they're the same CFT, and I'm just gonna say take different temperatures beta i. Okay, okay, perfect. And now we can ask sort of what an analogous calculation that we would do in gravity. So here again is the same thermal circle. And in gravity, when we calculate, say, a partition function, uh, let's make some thermal partition function, what we usually think of is that we're going to sum over some set of manifolds or some set of gravitational contributions that all have the same uh, boundary behavior. So this is my thermal circle again. And let me say a bunch of gravitational geometries that fill in that in some way. So here is some manifold M. And say I'm, I'm summing over all these uh, uh, gravitational contributions and say summing over maybe other things as well, but summing over a bunch of things whose behavior is fixed by this asymptotic boundary data. And you know, ADS-CFT tells me that if I do this in the right way, I sum over the right set of contributions that this is meant to be equal to the CFT partition function. And so we could kind of go through this same story as we did above. We could now think about having uh, n gravitational theories, each with their own temperature. And we could talk about this sort of n-fold partition so, function. Jimmy, so yeah. here uh, I can understand that you have used the fact that uh, there is a ADS-CFT duality. And That's right. So this, this here is meant, to, this is meant to be the statement of the ADS-CFT yes. duality. And also you did the calculation in the Euclidean signature. In the time. That's right. Yeah. So and in fact, everything in my talk I'm going to be doing in Euclidean yeah, I'm just for curiosity asking, is it possible to do the calculation in Lorentzian signature as well? Yeah, of the things I'm going to tell you today, I don't really, okay. Everything I tell you today has an extension into Lorentzian signature, but I don't understand exactly the right way to think about all the aspects of it. Okay. So the types of, yeah, at least, okay. The, the field theory things that I'll tell you today all okay. have a, sort of an obvious extension into Lorentzian signature. Okay. I don't understand as well the right gravitational picture to assign to those field theory calculations. Okay, perfect. So, anything else before I continue? No, no, no. <laughs> Great. I'm just asking. Yeah, please. And please, everyone, do interrupt me as often and as frequently as you like. There's no well, there's, there's no sort of end point we have to get to. So I'm really happy to just entertain all, all questions along the way. So oh, I might go back to a different color. So we can talk about the gravitational partition function with, with n boundaries. Uh, and it, the sort of naive thing we might think is, just, as in the field theory, that it's just this product of the sum contributions that we had for the single theory. So we just sort of sum over the same gravitational geometries that we're filling in this boundary. But there's also many other sort of gravitational contributions that we might want to consider. Actually, I should say too, if, I mean, if, if we did this, if we just took this sum, that this is sort of exactly then equal by the fact that if the single copy we had done the gravitational path integral correctly so that it was equal to the CFT path integral, then it would be necessarily true that this would just be equal to the n copy CFT 
partition function. So it sounds like, you know, at first, this is sort of the, the obvious right thing to do, that everything is sort of equal in this little square I've created here. Uh, but there's Jane, also other graph. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, may I ask a question? Please. So the, the beta one, beta two, beta n CFTs are they interacting among themselves? No, they're just completely independent. So when you write this partition function from the gravity side, um, and and the boundary is the circle one, circle two, up to circle n, is that the case? Yes. Are, aren't you allowing there an interaction between the different CFTs? Maybe. I'm not. I'm. I'm not assuming any interaction. So I mean, one could, one could ask the question about interacting CFTs. I'm assuming these are completely independent. That it's just the tensor product of these theories. So uh, from the starting point, you assume that they're free, kind of. They're free. Nothing. Nothing has to be free. It's just that the, the, this n copy theory is a tensor product of n theories okay, that don't talk okay, to okay. each other. Okay. I mean, if they were interacting, then I wouldn't have written them, them in sort of on separate boundaries. So they're not even, then they should have probably lived on the same boundary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the gravitational path integral also has other contributions that I could have included. Uh, so for example, there may be you know, gravitational geometries that say link two of them together, say like this, or there may be gravitational geometries that say link all of them together. So there's all of these geometries that I may also want to consider in my gravitational path integral or ask about why they are or are not included in my gravitational path integral. And you know, you know, if you just sort of taken the rules of ADS CFT that said that you should sum over all the gravitational contributions that have the sort of asymptotic behavior fixed by the CFT, fixed by say these thermal circles, then it would seem naively like these should be included. Of course, uh, if this above calculation up here, was equal to the n copy CFT one, when I include all of these other contributions, it's no longer going to be the case uh, that this is equal to the n copy CFT. And these contributions that I'm adding here are what are known as sort of Euclidean wormholes. And so if we include these, sort of the naive things we would have done before, like say if we calculate uh, the product, some correlator that say is a product of operators, each on a different copy of the theory, each on, like each, each on a different independent theory, then this is not just equal to the product of their correlation functions in each theory independently because these gravitational geometries will induce correlations between the different independent theories. And, you know, more, moreover, it's just no longer the case that this is equal to, or sorry, well, let, let me say this differently. Uh, instead of just thinking about the product of the partition functions, I really should have to replace them with something that will induce correlations between the different partition functions. I, I need to think somehow about some uh, correlation function of partition functions. And, just scroll. and so the real question becomes, you know, if, if the gravitational uh, partition function seems to require some notion of a, a correlation function of a correlator between different copies, we sort of need to understand what does this bracket mean. Um, so let me give two examples of cases in which we sort of have some understanding of what that means. One of them is that the partition function has some sort of microscopic parameter here. And so then we can think about this bracket has given you some bracket where you're averaging over this microscopic disorder. And so an example of this is the, say the SYK model. So there we have some Hamiltonian that depends on some microscopic parameter, say it's some sum over a bunch of terms, each with some uh, coupling J. And so the, we have some uh, average we want to do, then this is going to be not the partition function of some individual theory, but some partition function for the statistical averages over these j's, 
where we just integrate over all dj with, say, some, for example, in this case, some sort of just Gaussian waiting for the j's. And then all of our correlation functions are calculated using this statistical average over the j's. And so this will introduce uh, non-trivial statistical correlations between, say, different copies of the theory. Uh, another example that you may be familiar with are matrix models. So for example, you may draw some Hamiltonian, say, from some, uh, say, h is just some random L by L matrix. Uh, and then we can sort of average over this ensemble so we can integrate over all possible choices of this random matrix. Uh, again, we can have some measure on this so there can be some uh, potential that tells exactly how I want to do this measure. And then this is what I'm using to calculate uh, these brackets that I wrote down. So for example, you could compute something here in a matrix model, like the correlator of Z beta, Z beta. So uh, they need to calculate this. You, you choose this uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble type of thing? Yes, for, yeah, so here, okay, here I have some naive measure on the space of all random L by L matrices. And yeah. then, okay, here's some potential which can say change that measure, but it, it doesn't really matter for the, sake of argument I'm talking about here, just that you know, you have yeah. some space of theories, some space of random uh, Hamiltonians, and you're going to average over that space of random Hamiltonians. And mm -hmm. that means that I can compute something here. It's an average over Hamiltonians of the square of the partition function. And now there's a non-trivial two-point function here. True. Because this, this is this, it's dh. Here is some, some measure here. And then it's this. And so the, the gravitational picture, of course, is that, uh, oh, do this again, the right color. So in this so, language, people used to call it a uh, form factor, probably. This, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so here, you know, this picture has a, a uh, it has a gravitational dual uh, in terms of uh, 2D JT gravity. Mm -hmm. And in this theory, one sees the non-trivial two-point function in terms of these uh, connected geometries that link together the different boundaries, the exact sort of same type of geometries that I was discussing here. Yeah. I guess, oh, I should, I should put some references now and then. So this is uh, the well-known paper of Saad in Stanford. Uh, another option is to think, uh, I mean, okay, it's, it's not entirely different, but maybe it's sort of a different set of words for similar ideas, is to think uh, about the uh, partition function for my theory to be an, not say a number, but an operator. And this is sort of some way of thinking about the theory in terms of some third quantized theory of gravity. So uh, a recent example of this way of thinking about gravity is the recent work of Marolf. Maxfield. So there you think that uh, you have some, well, what they would call some baby universe Hilbert space. And in that Hilbert space, say there's a bunch of states that again, are labeled by these boundaries, which we can label are labeled by the partition functions. So for example, you have a bunch of boundaries and they're the stage you think about is, well, 
so the sort of half of some gravitational geometry. Uh, and you can define sort of the Hilbert space and all these overlaps by thinking about the overlap between all these different states. So there's some Overlap between two such states. Which I, I define in terms of some uh, gravitational path integral. So let me just write that very schematically. So that it's defined in terms of some uh, gravitational geometry where I, I fix all of these boundaries and sum over some appropriate set of gravitational geometries that fill them in. And so one can think about the partition function not as a number in this theory, but as an operator that takes, say, some state Uh, say here, let's just put some state, let's say with one boundary and maps it to a state with two boundaries. So these are two sort of common ways one thinks about what these averaging mean. I mean, they're not sort of independent from each other that, well, one can really think about the statistical averages as a type of field theory and uh, in the sort of sort of third quantized picture, one can often think about it also as some way of getting statistical averages. But these are sort of the two typical ways we think about what these uh, extra gravitational geometries mean and the types of correlations that they're introducing between different uh, naively independent copies of the theory. Uh, you know, another option to explain though that bracket is just to throw these geometries away to say, well, you know, well, if the I, I end... have just a question, maybe. Uh, sure. Like, yeah. So, wh why are you calling this? Uh, people are calling this uh, baby universe Hilbert space. Oh, I mean, in in this no. In this particular prescription, yeah, the example. In, in this, in this example, the number of boundaries isn't fixed by like. Typically, when we think about it, a single gravitational theory, we have say one universe, we have one boundary. But in this Hilbert space, the number of boundaries isn't fixed. There's no, so evolution doesn't necessarily preserve the number of boundaries. Okay. So you can have, you can have amplitudes for one boundary to go and produce two boundaries. Okay. So this, you know, the, this production of some other boundary is kind of like some baby universe. Okay. Now I get it. That has branched off from the universe you sort of naively thought you were talking about. But you, you may not like these. You may say, I, you know, I don't want to talk about a statistical ensemble over theories, or I don't want to talk about a third quantized theory of gravity instead of a single theory of gravity. So where I have, you know, baby universes and such. And so, so you may advocate that you just want to throw away these geometries, that this seems like some unnecessary and unpleasant complication. So, uh, and you may prefer the picture that we started with at the very top, where uh, the n boundary gravitational partition function uh, still was equal to the n boundary CFT partition function. So let me tell you why, or remind you why that's not a good uh, idea. And to do that, I want to sort of go and talk a little bit about the unitary evolution of black holes. So let's again take, uh, say here is, some thermal circle of length beta. Uh, and inside here, I'm just putting the sort of semi-classical saddle, the leading semi-classical saddle to that uh, partition function that is sort of the hartle hawking state, which produces the, the known sort of the state that we know and love, uh, the eternal black hole. So here in this sort of in this state, if we ask about the Hawking radiation, the Hawking radiation appears to be all entangled between modes that are uh, inside the horizon and modes that are outside the horizon. And so what I can try to do is uh, collect all of this uh, radiation outside the horizon and ask about its entanglement entropy. And one, one way to do that is just to attach some auxiliary system. 
that this is some auxiliary system that I couple to the boundary of my theory. So it lives here along the boundary. And then I can let all of this radiation leave my CFT and flow out into my auxiliary system. And at the same time, let, let's keep it at, at fixed temperature. So what I can also do is I can uh, have some other energy that I throw back in. So it's not radiating away, but I'm just sort of reaching equilibrium with this auxiliary system. And now I can ask about the uh, entanglement entropy of that radiation that I've collected, uh, say along some length here in the boundary. So let me draw a plot of that. So here is this just coordinate u. Here is the entanglement entropy. Uh, and if I just if I sort of just use this naive uh, semi-classical state, what I'll see is that this entanglement entropy just increases for all time. That every mode that I collect in the boundary is entangled with a mode behind the horizon, and so this increases without end. We know though this is not the consistent unitary answer. We know that there is you know. At fixed temperature, there's some sort of effective finite size of the CFT Hilbert space. And so we know that this radiation will go up for a while and then it'll turn over uh, and reach some constant. And so this, this is sort of what we what I'm going to call this sort of unitary page curve in this case. And I think, you know, for a long time what people have thought is that in order to see this, to see the, the right entanglement entropy, to see the unitary page curve, the, the moral had been, you know, we need to go beyond just the semi-classical saddle. We need to see the microscopic details of the state and the evolution. Of course, when you look at this uh, graph of the entanglement entropy, you may look at sort of very sharp transition here. And you may ask, sort of ask, you know, is, is such a very sharp transition sort of the hallmark of some phase transition? That is, if, if this segment here was computed by this one saddle, is there some other saddle that gives this other contribution that time, time dominates at later time? And the answer is going to be yes, but you know it wasn't obvious for I, I think a long time. It's sort of now in hindsight obvious that that's the right thing to do, but it certainly wasn't always the case. That, or it, was, it wasn't always clear that that was the right thing to do. So in order to give one way to think about it and to link it to the story that we're talking about, let me sort of draw a Euclidean version of the same picture that I was showing you above. So here is again my gravitational theory here. Uh, and again, I have my auxiliary system that I've coupled to it here, but I'm drawing some now some Euclidean path integral. And I'm going to cut open this Euclidean path integral, say along here, so that I can calculate uh, the density matrix for uh, this part of the system here, which I'm going to call R. So this is just all R along this yellow cut. And in order to do that, uh, I'll just calculate, to get the entanglement entropy, I'm going to calculate the Renyi entropies. So here is some schematic drawing of how I'm going to calculate some Renyi entropy. So here are n copies of the system, and each copy is glued together along this cut. And then we can ask how we calculate this gravitationally. And so there are the, neat, the naive gravitational solutions that just fill in each gravitational boundary independently. And these are exactly the contributions which give me this part of the curve here. Well, there's other gravitational solutions. They're exactly the type we're talking about before. There's ones that connect the boundaries together. So here is just a schematic drawing of some connected gravitational solution which connects all the different boundaries together. Uh, and if you do the calculation, you find that these new contributions to the path integral, these connected Euclidean wormholes, are exactly the part that gives you this other part of the page curve. And so uh, these sort of Euclidean wormholes are 
maybe if you'll let me, I'm just going to call them for now replica instant ons. are exactly the thing that gives you the page curve, the unitary evolution. So if you want to throw away these types of geometries in the path integral in order not to have to deal with ensemble averages, you're also going to have to uh, throw away this sort of elegant way of seeing the unitary evolution of black holes. And I, I think that would be a mistake uh, I think the fact that we can see this unitary evolution uh, in this, you know, this is a problem that has been confusing for uh, a very, very long time. So to see some uh, sort of partial solutions and partial understanding of unitarity is sort of a huge accomplishment and should really be a signpost that we're going in the right direction. But uh, if we want, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes. yeah, Question about this, this drawing you have in that page. Yes. Go on. Yeah. Um, th there are, in principle, many different ways of connecting these different boundaries, right? That's right, yeah. Which should I take? Or is there any leading one and, and why? Yeah, so you should sum over, I think the story is that you should sum over all of them mm -hmm. um, to calculate, say, the Renyi entropy. Um, and then in order to get the entanglement entropy, you, you sort of ask which ones are relevant when you're doing the analytic continuation. I see. Uh, and there, you know, in different phases, there, there'll be one that dominates in you when you take the analytic continuation, or at least I think that's our understanding right now in the cases we understand. I see. So, so I think, yeah. Connections that connect two given boundaries many times, right? So I could go from one to two and then from two to one and like that many times, uh, they will not count in this. Yeah, so it, it seems that like if you want to get Although, although to get the sort of full answer for all n would require many, many saddles, somehow the analytic continuation to get the entanglement entropy doesn't seem to care about that many of them. I see. I see. There's a much smaller number that seem to contribute. And I don't have a, a really robust answer for why that is. Thank you. But this, this is often, well, this is maybe something that is sort of familiar in lots of other examples. and we're, Calculating yeah. with entanglement entropies. Yeah, yeah, with instantons in general. Yeah. This is or in general, yeah, is that it seems like although, say, to get all the Renyis, there's many, many contributions, there's a much, much smaller subset that are actually important for yeah. other things you might care about. Yeah. So the question I want to sort of ask in the rest of my talk then is, uh, what can we say about a, a single unitary theory? So if I really want to have replica instantons or Euclidean wormholes in order to solve the information paradox, uh, you know, how do I how do I see them in a single year theory? Are are these Euclidean wormholes somehow still relevant in a single theory? Uh, and then in a single theory, what if they're calculating if they're not calculating this uh, product of partition functions? In a single theory, the product of n partition functions uh, doesn't appear to have any correlations. It's just a product of numbers. So. Uh, they're not calculating the averages in some ensemble over many theories. And, you know, can I, some, can I somehow find something like the Euclidean wormhole or the replica instanton that it gives me the unitarization of the page curve? Uh, the good news is that we do have some notion. So we're not going to be able to get rid of the notion of ensembling altogether, but we do have a notion of ensembling that is relevant to a single quantum theory, not a, not a whole, say, family or moduli space of quantum theories. And that's uh, the type of ensembling that we see in eigenstate thermalization. So let me just quickly review that. So let's take some high energy eigenstate. And let's take some simple operator. So this is just some simple operator. and some other eigenstate and calculate the expectation value of this op or the, the correlation function of this operator in these eigenstates. And so what we learned in eigenstate thermalization, if, if I have say a sufficiently chaotic theory is that the sort of leading piece is just uh, 
gives me the average value as an operator, say averaged over all nearby energy eigenstates, plus some uh, exponentially small pieces, uh, which are not diagonal, uh, but I uh, give some sort of uh, overlap between these different energy eigenstates. So in a, in a, a single theory, these Rijs are just, say, some fixed order one numbers. But uh, it's often the case that I don't care if I'm in energy eigenstate I or J, or I, I'm not able to make such a precise measurement. And so the types of questions I might want to ask, it doesn't, I don't need to know this exact matrix of numbers that gives uh, all of these correlators. And instead, I can just replace them with some random variable. <coughs> what and does so, that represent F2? Pardon? Yeah, the second term, can you explain a bit more? So this first term is really, these are really, this is really the, the average value, the mean. So if I took right. all of the nearby energy eigenstates, it says that uh, the leading term is zero unless I'm in the same, it's the same energy eigenstate. And the answer is always just given by the mean. Yeah. And then there is some variance. So it's not exactly the mean, but there's some exponentially small variance. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is, this is the variance term. And, it, and in a given theory, that variance, it's really some fixed set of numbers that you could go in your theory. And if you, you, you know, diagonalize a Hamiltonian and find the correct eigenstates, you can calculate all these numbers. Hmm. But you often don't care about questions that specific. And then the statement I want to make is that, you know, what we really do in ETH is that we don't think about, we don't worry about the exact matrix Rij, we just worry about, about, we replace it with some random variable. And as long as that random variable has the correct statistics, then on average, the calculations I use using my random variable Rij will be the same as if I had all of the microscopic details and the yeah. exact order one numbers. Yeah. And so, and sort of the goal for my talk then is to think about uh, how I write down some effective field theory for ETH. That is, how do I write down an effective field theory to describe the statistics of these random variables that appear in ETH uh, when I'm talking about some CFT? Uh, and of course, then how can I find some gravitational description in particular when I think about effective field theory, uh, at the end of the day, what I really want is some gravitational picture for that effective field theory. It should be a gravitational effective field theory. Well, got too many letters in there. So just to go for the outline, uh, I'm gonna just say a few more words first about, you know, it's good I'm 40 minutes into my talk and I'm giving you the outline, uh, but well, there we are. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit more about ETH and how to think about it or why to think about it as an effective field theory. And then I can just kind of build up this effective field theory and uh, first talking about how the effective field theory will describe the mean correlation functions and then the second moments and then a few words about higher moments and then a little bit about uh, how to think about sort of reconstruction of operators and black hole interiors and maybe some words about how to relate this to third quantization and some of the other work that's been done. So any questions about sort of motivation I've gone through so far or where we're going or just anything at all? James, may I ask you yeah. a couple of questions out of ignorance, Please. right? Um, yeah. So the first is suppose that your field theory were at zero temperature, right? Mm -hmm. What of all this can I apply or not? Um, yeah, that's a, the types of things I'm going to talk about are really relevant for questions when you're asking about simple operators in high energy backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So most of the things I'm saying are not going to be relevant at zero temperature. Good, good. And the second question is, in the motivation, you went over, as an example, a jacket tableborn like gravity. Mm -hmm. Could I do this for a field theory that is, say, higher, a CFT that is higher dimensional, supersymmetric, the ones we understand, could I propose a similar picture like the one you propose for the 
the, the, the replica wormholes, etc. So suppose that I want to do that in n equals four or ABJM or etc. Is is the ideology applicable in that case? Let me make sure I'm understanding your question. Yeah. Um, are you asking? Well, here. I guess here's the JT story. So in the JT story, you yeah. are averaging over some set of Hamiltonians. Correct. And that averaging gave you these Euclidean wormholes, which are Correct. relevant, say, Correct. for you know the black hole information story. Yes. Now, are, are, you, are you asking if I had some higher dimensional supersymmetric theory, is there a, like a moduli space of theories that I could average over in order to do that? Or are you asking, yeah. Yeah. Are you yeah. asking yeah. not that? Are you asking like if you, if you have one copy of just n equals four, it's the story that I'm going to tell you what ETH relevant. Well, maybe with one copy is not so much, right? You made a little proviso there, but actually I think it's the first question. I have many copies of say n equals four super young mills. How, how will, will this apply the, the things you're going to discuss or this kind of philosophy, so, will it apply? Yeah, the, the things that I'm going to tell you about would apply if you had many copies of n equals four super young mills. Things I can tell you are completely I'm going, to, I'm going to make very few specific claims. So I'm not going to use lots of details about which CFT I'm working at or how many dimensions I'm in. So they're very, very general. The really, the really only thing it really depends on is that your theory is sufficiently chaotic that it will make sense to average over nearby energy eigenstates. Right. Um, but I mean, the other thing is that, you know, you obviously can find family, if, if you have a moduli space of, theories that you care about, you can average over that moduli space. Good. You know, and so there's a, there were a recent set of papers just a couple of weeks ago, one by uh, Maloney and Witten, where they looked at some examples, say in, in 2D CFTs, where there was a moduli space that they understood that, you know, it's not the moduli space of all 2D CFTs, obviously, mm -hmm. but there, there was a very limited moduli space that they could average over and then ask questions like this. So what are the, what are the sort of Euclidean wormholes and geometries like that, that are, that, appear when you average over some moduli space. Thank you. Uh, I have a naive question. Uh, why don't these uh, Euclidean wormhole geometries uh, contribute when one is computing uh, just entanglement entropy in a single CFT uh, using the replica trick? So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that they, they do contribute in a single theory when you're using the replica trick. So there okay. are some examples where you would, there are, there are cases where they would be important. Okay, thanks. So let me talk a little bit more about uh, ETH and effective field theory. So maybe just say two words then about why, what we usually do when we talk about effective field theory. And when we usually talk about effective field theory, where we're usually thinking about, uh, and this is I think relevant to the earlier question about uh, zero temperature, we're usually talking about low energy experiments uh, in the vacuum. And if you're doing low energy experiments in the vacuum, uh, you know, the natural thing to do is to integrate out all energy, say, that are much, much greater than the energy of your experiment. So this is, it's this sort of type of very simple reasoning that leads us to effective field theory and the RG, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in black hole physics, we're in a very different setting. So why is it very different? Well, for one thing, we care about energies that are large, that is, that are order of the central charge of the CFT. You know, in a gravitational theory, that's very large. And so we can't integrate out these energies if we're going to be doing experiments in these backgrounds. Uh, on the other hand, in a gravitational CFT, the entropy of states uh, in this regime where E is order C uh, is order E to the C. And this implies then that the energy splittings between different states nearby is e to the minus c, just the inverse. And this implies is, is that if you wanted to know what is the sort of relevant time scale for an experiment that would distinguish or differentiate between two of these eigenstates, 
set. Now, usually this just goes like the uh, inverse of the energy splitting. And so it's again, e to the c. Now, I think it's fair to say that no experiments we're going to do as sort of finite lifetime gravitational observers are ever going to probe length scales that are order e to the c. And so if one wants to build uh, an effective field theory that's relevant for experiments at very large energy, but say finite times, the natural thing to do is not to integrate out uh, uh, large energies, but to integrate out these large times. And so what that means is we're really integrating out these microscopic splittings. We're throwing away the fine energy splittings between these two states. And so then what I want to say is that the effective field theory, should it describe the physics of uh, a, any given microstate or any given energy eigenstate, but it should describe the average. So the effective field theory should describe average or, you know, or typical uh, microstates. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take some state and I'll draw it at random in some, if I'm asking a question at a certain energy, I'll draw it at some random in some energy window where, you know, I don't care too much exactly what the width of this window is. This width is sort of just defined by my, you know, my experimental resolution about sort of the types of time scales, the types of lifetimes that I care about. Uh, any questions about that motivation? So let me be more specific about what I'm going to mean by my ensemble then, just to be very definite. So uh, I could talk about, say, you know, working at some fixed temperature, uh, but I'm going to, for simplicity, just work in a microcanonical picture. So I'm always going to talk about a fixed energy window. And nothing I really say is limited to that perspective. It's just some simple way to introduce you to all of the ideas. So the Hilbert space that I'm going to talk about is just this Hilbert space of states that are in this window about energy E. And I'm always going to be talking about, say, collections of states. And I'll say, I'll, I'll take n of them. n is just some number that I'm free to choose moment to moment. So I'll take n states. And these will be drawn at har random in this Hilbert space. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, you could think about each of these states, psi i as being a particular unitary operator acting on some fixed fiducial state, and then these unitaries are just drawn with a hard measure over all unitaries. And earlier, we talked a little bit about thinking about averages with some bracket notation. Uh, I don't want to use brackets because the brackets are going to appear when I talk about correlators of actual states in my Hilbert space. And so instead, I just like to use an overbar notation for all my averages where I'm averaging over these choices of states. So for example, let's just draw the, to the simplest possible one. I could take two random states and ask about their average overlap. So that in this notation, well, we can assume that I have some, there's, there are n of these random states I chose. I'll average over all UKs. There's the fiducial state, and then there's the particular use that define these states I'm talking about. And if you average over these two unitary operators, so I'm averaging over all n of them, but only two of them are relevant. Only two of them appear in this uh, correlator. The others just all uh, average out to integrate over to one. So the measure is chosen such that it's not infinite. It's just equal to one. Uh, this is just equal to a delta function. So the average overlap of two randomly drawn states is uh, zero, unless they're the same randomly drawn state. 
Now we can also just be a little more specific about what we mean by simple operators. Uh, really at the end of the day, all that matters is that the simple operators are anything that's sufficiently generic. That's it. So they look like a random operator in this Hilbert space. Uh, usually, uh, the things that are going to have this property, the, the ones that we actually care about, are just products of uh, local CFT operators. So it's just some product, and, and, not, and a product of not too many of them. Say so you could take some here small n number of CFT operators at different points. And as long as these operators aren't too large in dimension, and there's not too many of them, that these will behave like simple operators in, in the, as far as I sort of it matters for my talk. And so again, our goal is going to be to describe the effective field theory for the typical microcanonical averages, the expectation values of these simple operators, and find sort of a gravitational description where all of the means that I'm calculating have a nice description in terms of gravitational saddles. So let's just start off with the simplest one. So we're going to calculate uh, this, the mean correlator where we take two different random states and calculate uh, the correlator of some simple operator. So let me write down what this is. It's given by the, uh, here, I'll write the average over all of these u's. Here is this the fiducial state, ui dagger, oa, uj, psi naught. And if you go look up in your uh, favorite book of that shows you how to do Haar integrals, you'll find that the answer for this is a, a delta function again. Delta ij, they have to be the same randomly drawn state times e to the minus s, and then the trace over this window of the operator. So we can assemble all of the possible correlators into a partition function, just to keep track of the value. So I can write z1 e with a bunch of sources j a, and define this just to be the sum J A trace. Okay, so derivatives of this partition function with respect to J A gives me back these uh, microcanonical traces that is give out give back the average expectation value. Now, there's a very simple gravitational picture. Uh, it's one that I think, well, hopefully no one will object to because I think it's sort of part of our well-established ADS-CFT dictionary. And that just says that this partition function is just equal to the gravitational partition function at fixed energy with these sources inserted. This is then, just to give this a name, this is really what we just call a microcanonical black hole. Uh, this microcanonical black hole is really the same black hole we're familiar with. So it's this. It's the same uh, finite temperature black hole at some temperature beta where you know the, the saddle point energy for this particular beta is the energy that I care about. So we can just draw a picture to describe that. Here is my thermal circle of length beta, where beta is the right beta for energy E. Uh, it's filled in just by the semi-classical gravitational geometry with those boundary conditions. And I can, you know, insert uh, all of my sources here. So actually going from this, you know, gravitational to this, this sort of canonical to microcanonical pictures, this is, I guess, Don Morolf had a paper just a couple of years ago sort of explaining how one uh, projects the gravitational path integral and shows that it's dominated by the same saddle as the, the finite temperature black hole, if that's something that makes you slightly uncomfortable. But this picture is meant to be sort of something that's very familiar to you. It's just saying that, you know, the average 
average partition functions uh, are described by the semi-classical gravitational geometry we're familiar with. And I think this is the type of averaging we're sort of very accustomed to in ABS and CFT. But let me just stop and make sure everybody's happy. So Jimmy, there is a question in the chat box. I don't think I can see the chat box. Okay. So I can, I can say that in the okay. EFT, will the states still be orthonormal? Won't sufficiently flow states would start having some overlap? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The EFT is just describing the averages. So I don't, um, I don't really, it, it's not, I guess I don't have a good notion of states that are sufficiently close to each other. They're all just sort of randomly drawn states in this window. And then the EFT will only tell you about what you typically expect when you make those random draws. I mean, definitely if the, the person asking the question can, it's free to maybe type something in more if they want more clarification, but I'm, I'm not sure I properly understood their question. Hope maybe that was helpful. I'll continue for now, but definitely let me know if there are more questions or in the chat otherwise. So what I can do is write down Feynman rules to describe this, this calculation, to describe this effective field theory. So the, the vertices in my theory, I can take vertices that, that these, each of these sort of correlation functions acts like a vertex. So this is some vertex in my theory. So I, it's some operator that I insert into my correlation function. And I'm going to denote it this way. So here is the I and J, the bra and the cat. I'll draw little arrows to indicate the bra versus the cat. So this is some sort of expectation value here. I'm going to put the operator as a little A. I'm going to draw some extra lines here just to, so, to indicate uh, the. Let me the... just one confusion. Okay. So once you define this EFT, so you want to define at the boundary or inside the bulk? So the effective field theory I'm describing is just the effective field theory defined purely in the CFT. Yeah, but so not I, I, have, I, have, I have all these average correlators I calculated in the CFT. I'm going to give you some Feynman rules that give you those averages, and they describe the relevant bulk geometry as well. OK, OK. Now, why I'm asking? Because you have told that gravitational EFT, that's why. Uh, yeah, so I guess maybe think about it. I, I'm going to give you. I need to find the effective field theory first in the CFT okay. and then show you that that effective field theory has a simple gravitational picture. So that's the, the order of the argument. So first to find the effective field theory and then show uh, that the, the, the nat natural way of calculating this effective field theory is using gravitational saddles. Okay. Well, I, I guess at the moment I kind of did it. In this first step, I did a little opposite because I think the gravitational picture is very familiar here. And I just wanted to say that first. Let me give you the sort of Feynman rules now. So here, here is the sort of vertex uh, line. And this carries some weight e to the minus s. There's also then a propagator. So I can think about the sort of outer product of two of these, the sort of average as like a propagator that goes from i to j. But maybe I've actually. Oh, And I'm going to draw, there's actually an, another line I'm going to draw here, which just indicates sort of some basis you write it in. I'm going to use this double line notation, which is maybe slightly non-transparent, non but I think it's helpful. So it contracts indices of operators as well. So an example of how you use these Feynman rules. So let's just write the Feynman rule for the calculation that I did above. So I have the vertex ij with an operator a. So here are these lines. And now I can contract these lines with my vert with my propagator like this. And so uh, this carries some delta ij from the propagator. There's a factor of e to the minus s from the vertex. And when these, this inner index line gets contracted all the way around, it gives me the trace of that operator. 
And so this is just using the Feynman rules. This is the exact answer that we got above. So it's just another way of writing this calculation I did there. So here's something that is just like a very, okay, it's, it's again, the same calculation, but let me just say, you can define something like an average CFD partition function where instead of uh, summing over the e to the s exact energy eigenstates, I can sum over e to the s random states. So here I'm summing over e to the s psi i's where they're just drawn at random. And so this is really just e to the s copies of that calculation before. So it's e to the s. Here we're going to put all these sources in. And then here is this calculation from before. I'll just draw the Feynman diagram for it. So this is equal to then just the sum of J A trace of O A. And so this, when you sum over e to the s copies, you get rid of the e to the minus s factor that came from each individual one. You get just this microcanonical trace. And so this, this CFT partition function is sort of exactly the, again, the partition function we're familiar with without the e to the minus s factor. So it's just, again, sort of gravitationally, it's just this uh, solution right here. Any questions about that so far? James, I miss why you weighted the the vertex with an e to an e to the minus s. So why why the e to the minus s in front of the vertex? Ah, uh, that's just this e to the minus s here. Uh, I so see. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 And this comes from calculating with a, a given hard measure. That's right. It's just the. It's exactly that. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. So let's do the second moments now. Unless there were more questions about the first moment. So this is when I think we're actually starting to build something that's beyond the sort of typical things that we see in ADS CFT. The typical the typical type of averaging we're familiar with. So let's calculate the second moment of some correlation function. So here I'll just take uh, four different states, psi i, psi j, psi k, psi l, and calculate uh, the average value of this product of correlation functions. So let's write it out. So the first term, technology is sometimes not perfect. Let's see, maybe I'll stop tapping frantically and just give it a moment to catch up. Oh. Could just be that all my batteries are going to die in the middle of my talk. That would be. Just the way things go some days. Let's see, there we go. So there's a, a delta function IJ delta function KL e to the minus 2s trace OA trace OB and then some extra factor here. Delta. So this is the first term that appears in doing this. Uh, and then there's one more term, let me just write it out. Okay, so now let me just describe to you what we are looking at here, now that I've written down this somewhat long expression. So this first part here, this is just the mean squared term. Right? It's just the product of the two means. Uh, there's also, okay, there's also some extra little bit here. So there's some e to the minus s correction to that mean. But if I just ignored this piece momentarily, then this first line would just be the mean squared. 
Um, I also then have this second line. Unlike the mean squared, this is some connected component of this average in that uh, the two operators are traced together. Now, I should make one clarification here. Inside this trace, I'm going to write the product with some special little star. Uh, and that's just to be kind of uh, to save some time. And when I write OA star OB, what I really just mean is OA uh, OB, where in between I've put some projector onto that energy window. That is just because when I do these HAR averages, uh, you average over the unitaries, they contract the indices of the operators, but they only contract them in the, in, within the Hilbert space I'm averaging over. And so I'm not taking the product of the operator OA and OB where I contract their operator indices over the entire Hilbert space. I'm just contracting them over this energy window I'm averaging in. And so I'll just put that little star operator just to indicate that it's not the full operator product, it's the operator product in this window. So I can write this in terms of uh, a set of partition functions again. So this is delta ij, delta kl, e to the minus 2s. And then it's just the, these, this partition function I defined before, this mean partition function. Uh, times 1 plus this correction. And then there is the delta jk, delta li. And then I'll write this um, next term in terms of some connected correlator, which I'll call z2. So just to be specific, um, z2. Let me put some indices on these. This is just equal to just this very simple thing. So I can write Feynman rules to describe uh, this new calculation. So the first term in the Feynman rule, the product of means is just given by the, you know, it's given by the product of the two diagrams before. So let me write this. So here's the A one. Here is uh, the B one. And then the connected one also has a description in terms of Feynman rules. And it's, we can write it in terms of the same set of Feynman rules. Yeah, let me put the indices here too. So this is I, J, L, K. And so it's the same set of Feynman rules, which give me the second term. But it's just where they're contracted in the other way. So you are calling this to be the subleading on uh, e to the power minus is uh, expansion? So, so this term here is z1 squared. Yeah. And this is the z2. Oh, OK. So it's the same Feynman rules that I used in the mean case give me both the disconnected squared piece and the connected piece. OK. That is, here I can just write it out. This piece is the delta ij, delta kl, trace oa, trace ob. And this is the delta jk, delta li, trace oa star ob. And you can see, you see the trace, this, this line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This line um, here is the tr one trace, here's the other trace, and then here is the two operators traced together. There's a single index line that connects them. Hmm. And it's just the two different ways of contracting uh, those diagrams. In order to get the subleading term, so uh, I do need to add some extra piece. So I need to add some new vertex, which connects all these lines together. 
And so this is some new vertex I can add that has um, some term like this. So this is just some new addition I need to get the self terms. And then I can talk about the gravitational picture. So just to be very uh, schematic. So this piece here, trace that has the, the product of two and a connected one that is the diagram that looks like this. The gravitational picture is rather simple. I just have, uh, again, a thermal circle of total length beta. But the operators are now inserted uh, on opposite sides of that thermal circle. So they're separated by some you know, beta e over 2 along the circle. The e to the minus s correction, I can sort of think about this. Now, this is not a true gravitational picture, so I want to make that caveat clear. What we can think is that we have these two different thermal circles, each one with operator OA, OB. This is, I'm drawing the, connect, the correction to the disconnected piece. And then there is some sort of uh, topologically non-trivial bridge which sort of joins the two of them together. So there's a, an understood gravitational picture for this top one where there is some known, you know, semi-classical saddles that fill this in that allow me to compute the correlation function gravitationally of two operators on opposite sides of the thermal circle. Uh, well, uh, I don't have a good, I don't have a, like a true gravitational picture that tells me about this sort of topologically non-trivial bridge that would give this correction, but I just want to sort of give that as some sort of schematic motivation. Yes? Yeah. So uh, like in the first uh, uh, interpretation, uh, like you told that this uh, star means some projector. So in terms of the diagram, you draw this circle, what projector actually do here? Yeah, so the projector is just what separates the two operators on opposite sides of the thermal circle. Okay. okay, okay. So if I wrote for you, here, this is the good thing about uh, doing talks this way is I have an infinitely large page to write things, right? So if I wrote for you this trace OA, OB, here they're, um, here the, the, the two operators are multiplied, they're, they're, the product is taken over the entire Hilbert space, and that means the operators live very close by, right? So there's OA and OB both live here. Okay. But when I change the energy that contracts the two operators, that moves the other operator some distance around the circle. All it is, right, is that you, you can think about it this way, is that you really have like, um, here. you could think more generally about this, something like this, e to the minus beta one, some calculation like this. And then you could ask, uh, what is the, where, where, what, what energy dominates each of these? So how do I choose beta to get some particular energy that uh, is a sort of dominant saddle, the dominant contribution? And uh, what we want is it's the same energy that dominates both. And so to do that, you have to separate them uh, equally spaced around the circle. If there are different betas, you get different energies that dominate. True. Thank you. Great. So let's calculate just some examples. So the first thing is the product. So we, we talked before, we wrote down this sort of what I call the average CFT partition function. Um, that is, instead of taking the fixed energy eigenstates, we just drew e to the s random states and took their average. We can do the same thing, but now we just take the average uh, of the product of two of them. So we take um, e to the s states, and then we take, we sum over e to the s times e to the s of them. 
Uh, it's important though that in each copy I'm drawing over the same set of random states. So these i and j's are not indexing two separate sets of e to the s states, but they're just indexing the same, the same e to the s states. That's important because I want these sets of random states to be correlated with each other, not to be independent. So again, if I do this calculation, uh, there's a leading term, which is what we expect. It's just the product of the two partition functions. Here there is, again, some small correction. And then there is this connected piece. Again, with some exponentially small uh, correction. So this piece here is just the, you know, this is just the product of the two mean ones. So this is what we expect. We're calculating the product of two partition functions. It's just sort of where we began this whole story, right? We have um, two copies of our theory. We're calculating the product of two partition functions. And this first piece is sort of the naive thing we expected. We have a sort of gravitational solution that fills it in. But we also have these other contributions here. Uh, so let me just actually write down all the contributions here just right below. So the first term we have is some piece like this, where we put operator A over here and operator B over here. So this is contribution one. The second thing is sort of like the types of saddles uh, we are talking about. So here, we have the two naive copies of the theory have been glued together into a single geometry. Uh, and we also, actually, I made a mistake. I think I've been writing pluses here in my talk. I think this is actually a minus sign. I apologize. Okay. It doesn't really matter, but I think this exponentially small contribution actually comes with the minus sign, and I was just... Uh, not doing that entirely accurately, so sorry. So then we have these other contributions, which are sort of more topologically non-trivial solutions. So here is sort of the, the full answer now to the product of two partition functions. It has this disconnected mean piece, and it has some connected Euclidean wormhole that glues the two copies together. Another uh, calculation, which is interesting to do, is to calculate uh, the second Rendy of some density matrix. So here I'm going to take some density matrix, which is just sort of an average of e to the k uh, randomly drawn states. And I'm going to here I'll calculate the purity. So I'll just calculate row, the trace of row squared as a, as a proxy for actually doing the harder calculation of the entanglement entropy. Uh, so more generally, I'm going to think about this calculation uh, not just as trace of row squared, but I can think about it again in the way we've been doing a lot as a partition function. So I define zk2, where in between the two copies of row, I've inserted operators. And so I give the sources for those operators. And we can ask how to calculate this. So here, zk2. Which I'll here, we'll just define, actually, sorry, we did define it already. It's equal to two, two terms again, e to the minus 2s minus k times, okay, I'll just write it this way as z1 squared times 1 minus 1 over. It's exponentially small contribution. And then there is some term that goes like e to the minus 2s times z2, again, with some small contribution. So again, what we see here uh, is that, well, here, let me just point this 
first is that th these two terms, unlike above, they carry different weights. So let's just look at this above calculation. With a product of two partition functions, we saw this connected piece here had some exponential suppression. It was weighted e to the minus s. And one way you can see that is that there are, you know, because we're just summing over uh, the psi i's in each copy, uh, that the sum itself isn't actually correlated. It's just sort of, we're just picking up on these exponentially small correlations in the variances we see when we have the same state on both copies. It's very, very small. But here in this case, where we're taking this outer product, there's this actually induces sort of more correlation between the different copies of the, the theory in this picture. And so the, the weighting's a little different. And so this e to the minus 2s can actually dominate over this e to the minus 2s minus k when k is sufficiently large so that the, the first term is suppressed. And so this, in this case, of all above, the connected piece was sort of exponentially small. Here, the connected piece can dominate. And so what I can do is just draw a plot of s2 versus k. And you see at first is that as k grows larger, uh, this is increasing. But then eventually, it turns over. Uh, in exactly the way we wanted to see the entanglement entropy turn over. And it has the exact same structure. So this uh, first part here, where S2 is increasing, is due to this disconnected piece. This later piece here, where it turns over and becomes constant, is due to this piece becoming the dominant contribution. So we see exactly we have this feature where we have these two different saddles, or these two different gravitational saddles even, uh, giving the turnover and the purity of these two different phases. And we can do the same thing for higher moments. So uh, I don't want to go into the details, um, but again, we could calculate a moment where we have sort of arbitrary many correlation functions multiplied together. Uh, they have the same Feynman rules. We just need to add additional vertices. So just like we needed to add uh, this term here to get the e to the minus s corrections. There's further corrections when you have more copies that uh, essentially check when, the, when all the different copies are in the same state and give corrections when that's the case. So we'll have you know, like a 3.1 and a 4.1, et cetera, et cetera. And these have a nice gravitational description. Um, so again, we can think about some type of calculation where um, we have connected pieces where several of the boundaries all live together on one sort of one boundary space time, and then we have topologically non trivial bridges that glue them together. I just want to take a few minutes towards the end just to talk about the paper from last year by Pennington, Schenker, Stanford, and Yang, where their, you know, they, you know, their paper really sort of inspired our paper, and the language that I'm using is sort of very tied to the language they used. So there they were studying J, 2D JT gravity. Um, and they did like similar calculations, for example, they talked about some density matrix where there they were summing over um, a bunch of states which they were sort of end of the world brains in the JT gravity theory. Uh, and they then did a similar study where they wanted to look, say, at the Rendy entropies, trace rho to the n. And the gravitational geometries they found had the sort of form of a picture I drew here where you have a whole bunch of boundaries and they're glued together in various uh, sort of Euclidean wormholes, which are sort of ended on end of the world brains. Uh, and I just want to say is that there's sort of like a one-to-one -one mapping between the types of pictures that they would have had, the types of gravitational solutions they had, and ours. So here you can see like they had one where like boundary one, two, and three were all glued together by end of the world brains into a single gravitational geometry. The equivalent type of picture we have here has one, you know, Theory, sort of boundary one, two, and three all glued together into a single thermal circle, where instead of an end of the world brain, they're sort of just glued together at a point. So that whole end of the world brain has sort of been re replaced with a single point. And again, they had these sort of the topologically non trivial bridges, and we have the same thing in our story too, which are just these uh, extra terms we put in to get all of these e to the minus s corrections. So there's sort of an exact mapping between the, their gravitational solutions and the things that we're finding. Um, just a statement is that, you know, th their geometries are not the same as ours. And that's just because, well, I guess several things. For one thing, they're talking about the ensemble in JT and they're talking about a density matrix that is given by a bunch of these end of the world brains. 
But here we have a different ensemble. It's just the sort of random microcanonical ensemble, and our states are just random microcanonical states. So um, if you change the ensemble, if you use a different ensemble, you'll have a different gravitational picture that describes the way the two, the different theories are correlated and connected together. So for example, you know, our story could very much be extended. Instead of talking about the microcanonical picture, we could talk about a canonical picture where we sum over random states uh, at all energies weighted by e to the minus beta e. And then instead of uh, these being glued together just with uh, the identity operator in this in a, in a single microcanonical um, window, the different boundaries are glued together just with e to the minus beta h. So the sort of length of this thermal circle is changing. It's not a, a fixed length thermal circle like it was in the microcanonical picture. So it's, it's the sort of the, the state we choose and the ensemble determine the, the, the relevant wormhole geometry. And so the point is, is then that even in uh, a single copy of the theory, in this sort of very naive case where we're just assuming our state is randomly drawn in some microcanonical window, we have all the same phenomenology and just the exact gravitational picture is what changes to describe that. Now I'm running almost out of time. So I had some story I could tell you about bulk effective field theory in islands, but I think I'll just skip over that since we're nearly at the end of an hour and a half. And I, I can definitely answer questions about it uh, a little later. And let me just you know, answer questions in the, in the question period after. Let me just give you just a quick summary of what we've done. So uh, we constructed an effective field theory to describe measurements of finite lifetime observers. The effective field theory describes the statistics that is all the means and the moments of CFD correlation functions and products of CFD correlation functions. And there's a bulk gravitational description of these higher moments in terms of connected Euclidean wormholes or replica instantons that take the different sort of copies of the theory and glue them together into a, a single gravitational theory, into a, a single boundary. So thank you. So, <laughs> We uh, please unmute and clap for him for giving such a nice talk. Now, uh, uh, you can ask questions, but before that, I would uh, request uh, him to say something about the island also. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, let me just figure out. Uh, yeah, how I can sort of take our arbitrary amounts of time. So do my, I may just see what else. I'll say, sorry, say something quickly. Um, hey, you don't need to think about you have a time restriction because most of okay. the business people just go for two and a half hours. Okay, something. then yeah. I, uh, I'll just go through something quickly then to yeah. just say a, a little bit about it. Um, great. Let me just apologize. Sorry, my computer is slow at times and it takes a little bit for it to... Okay, so let me just try to um, um, just sort of, I, what, all, all I'm gonna do is just sort of reproduce some of the arguments and story that was told in the Pennington, Sajschenker, I'm uh, sorry, Pennington, sorry, in the, uh, in the Pennington, Schenker, Stanford, and Yang paper, sorry, I get all the S's mixed up about who, which S is which one, uh, but just sort of to uh, relate it to the story that I'm telling here. So um, let's consider, let me choose to a pen that's not red. So the main thing I want to tell you is, is sort of how to consider the bulk effective field theory and sort of ask, you know, when are operators in the bulk effective field theory uh, contained within sort of within the CFT itself or within some reference that has become entangled with the CFT. And so when, when is it sort of controlled by, when, when is it contained in some island that is controlled by some auxiliary system? So to, to do that, we have to go beyond the sort of semi-classical saddle picture I was talking about. So we want to consider uh, an effective field theory. So we can just consider some basis of states in the effective field theory. Let's just consider some 
basis of states that are orthogonal. And we consider sort of operators in this effective field theory. These matrix elements. And what we want to do is we can kind of sort of embed this sort of naive semi-classical effective field theory into our into our Hilbert space. So we can build corresponding bulk states or corresponding gravitational states. So we can take um, states like this. That are also that are much like the A and B states that they're orthogonal to each other. Although I can add sort of small corrections to them, so they just need to be approximately orthogonal. And now we can consider uh, these operators acting in some code subspace. So we can take we're going to take some sort of an entangled state like our, our entangled density matrices that we're interested in. So we'll consider some state. like this. So this is a state of a bunch of random states in our microcanonical window that are entangled with some reference system. So we trace out the reference we're in one of these sort of very entangled states. And then we can build these sort of effective field theory states on top of this just by taking sums of these Psi IAs that have chosen to have the, the right overlaps. And so we can define uh, operators that act on these. just using the matrix elements of the operator from the effective field theory. So we just replace you know, the outer product of A and B with the outer product of Psi A and Psi B. And so now this is an operator that acts uh, on my gravitational states and has the same matrix elements on those gravitational states as sort of the, the naive uh, effective field theory picture that I was trying to reproduce. And now the sort of question about the island is sort of when this operator this effective field theory operator that's acting in my gravitational theory on my CFT, when is it an operator uh, that is acting on this auxiliary reference system alone? That is, when is it sort of controlled by the, when is it with inside the island? And just to give a very sort of schematic picture, let me sort of just go through what uh, Pennington and, and friends called the sort of the pet's light map, where you can try to reconstruct this operator in a, in a naive way just by tracing over the CFT of the operator that act jointly. And maybe I should make that clear is that, you know, this operator here, uh, as you can see from the uh, outer products that appear in it, Psi A is an operator that acts both in the CFT Hilbert space and in the reference. So to get an, uh, an operator that acts just on the reference and the auxiliary system, the naive, one naive thing you can just do is sort of just trace over the CFT and the operator you're left with is something that acts just on, on the auxiliary system. So we can write out what this operator is. So this is a sum over i, j, a, and b. i, j. So this is what you get from this trace. And so if I take this operator and I calculate um, its, um, sorry, if I calculate its matrix elements, so I go then this is a sum over i, j, a, b, uh, sorry, I think they're capital, let me capitalize these ones here.
So this is what we get from calculating that uh, matrix element. And what we want, right, is that we would like this to be, so we want this to equal OAB, right? OAB. That is, we want it to have the correct matrix element uh, as the operator we're trying to uh, reproduce. And so you can see, and we'll just say this very schematically, is that uh, whenever these are sufficient, whenever this operator is sufficiently random, this will work. So if we look at this here and we ask, you know, what is the, the average value we expect for this? Oh, and again, I keep writing small letters. I want the big ones first, just to be consistent. And I look at these averages. Well, if these are, if these states in the uh, uh, effective field theory Hilbert space are also just sort of behave like randomly drawn states, and we're just doing the same picture we had before. So uh, the mean part here and here are equal to zero, unless uh, i equals j and a equals b. And here, i equals j, a equals b. But if we're summing over enough, if we're summing over enough of them. Oh, sorry. I'm just realizing I did one more thing wrong. I reversed the order here. So this was J B and this was I A. So if there's enough entanglement in the system, then it's not this mean term which vanishes, but it's the connected piece that dominates. And then we know that this will not this will vanish as long as these are the same state, right? that there's a connected piece whenever this is the same state as this, and this is the same state as this. That's when we had the connected contribution. And so that gives a connected piece that's large whenever uh, here B is equal to B and A is equal to A. And that's exactly the condition we want. So whenever, if there's a connected piece that only survives when these two indices are equal, then the only matrix element that contributes is OAB, which says that there's an operator. We can sort of recover the operator uh, we wanted acting on the radiation alone, as long as it's sort of sufficiently random in this microcanonical Hilbert space. And the types of you know, operators that have that behavior, of course, are things like, well, well you, know, th th you know, operators behind the black hole horizon are things that are sort of, sort of quite random and, in the, in the microcanonical Hilbert space. So we, we see we recover these operators whenever the state is sufficiently entangled. So hopefully that wasn't too long and wasn't too schematic. But this, I mean, if that was a little kind there's a very you know, beautiful and nice and clear, clear story in the Pennington paper. And the point I'm, I wanted to make is really just to show that uh, there's a very simple analogous description and it has you can tell the story just in terms of sort of when states are sufficiently random in this Hilbert space you get good recovery. Other questions? Any questions? Please ask. I think I can now that I'm not Okay. I think I was trying to see if I could also check the chat window, but I think I, No more questions? 
I don't think so. Okay. Everybody have understood everything. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> okay. So, um, guys, you want to discuss anything with him? You can ask. Yeah, please feel free to ask me anything. I'm very happy. So. Actually, the thing is, in your place, it is very early morning and like here, it is already uh, near around seven o'clock. Yeah, everybody's tired. And, yeah, and in India, it is 11 o'clock in the night. Yeah, the timing's hard, isn't it? Yeah, that's the main problem. But uh, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, like I have enjoyed a lot of, and I have actually understood a lot of things uh, from the talk which Good. was a little, little bit unclear when I read the paper because you have explained in a, such a nice way. So it actually helps a lot. So That's I a hope, lot. hopefully other people will also be uh, like, they will get a lot of things from the top. Great. And definitely if anyone is exhausted at seven o'clock at night, yeah, feel, so free I to, think, I, I, you feel free to email me in the future. If yeah, you yeah, yeah. I questions. just want to say that those who actually look into this talk after posting in YouTube, you can write to him uh, by asking any question. Uh, like he can able to give answer. If you have really uh, some question related to his uh, talk, he can explain to you. Yeah, I'm always happy to. So thank you very much for agreeing to give it this talk in the so early morning. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. So, yeah, so like you, you live with your family. So um, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was cutting out there. But yeah, everyone definitely yeah. stay safe, safe and healthy. Yeah. And uh, like, so like, I, I want to discuss something with you. Uh, so maybe I will write to you. Uh, yeah, I'd be maybe. happy to. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So, see you then. Bye.